Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, if you'll turn with me over to the book of Micah, we are going to look at Micah chapter 1. Now, I will have this up on the board in terms of the uh, verses within the passage, but uh, you still want to get accustomed to looking and flipping open the books and going to Micah and looking at the, the chapter for yourself. Uh, that's what expositors mean, to exposit, to explain, to read the text, which presupposes that you're looking at it as you're holding it in your hand, and we're moving forward. So today, we're going to cover chapter 1, but before we get into the book of Micah uh, properly, let us consider the framework for understanding the book in Micah's appeal and in Micah's plea. Uh, which we will see this morning. Uh, you'll recall that God comes into covenant relationship with the children of Israel after they are released from slavery from Egypt, where they were enslaved for 430 years. God brings them to Mount Sinai. He enters into a uh, bilateral covenant with them uh, in which God promises blessing for their obedience and God promises cursing for their disobedience of the Mosaic Covenant. And you say, well, what was the purpose of the Mosaic Covenant? There were several purposes for it in terms of revealing the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, and so forth. Uh, but it was also a political and uh, social and religious constitution for the nation of Israel. In other words, the Mosaic Covenant was given so that the children of Israel could enjoy the promises of the Abrahamic Covenant then and there based upon their obedience uh, or disobedience. They would not enjoy the provisions or blessings, at least temporally, of the Abrahamic Covenant at that time. So some of the blessings that uh, were included in following the Mosaic Covenant were protection from enemies, uh, they were to experience material prosperity, they were to have a holy reputation uh, from their neighbors, that is their neighbor nations, uh, they were to experience prosperity in the land, uh, they would have plenty of rain and financial stability, which is always important in an agrarian country, or nation, and they would be a leading nation among its peers. Israel was selected by God to be a light to the rest of the world through which the world would be blessed through national ethnic Israel. If, however, they were to disobey God, then God promised cycles of cursing, which would start with destruction and disease, followed by drought. They would experience defeat in battle. They, were, they would experience physical and mental illnesses, oppression and crime, and ultimately that would lead to exile. So what we see then is that God gave them plenty of time and they followed this course here. And eventually the Assyrians uh, will take the 10 northern tribes of Israel into captivity in 722 B.C. and then the nation of Judah, because at the time of Micah, what we are looking at is that time when Israel has been divided. Uh, you'll recall it started with King Saul. There was a united kingdom. Under David, there was a united kingdom. Under Solomon, there was a united kingdom. But then it split after Solomon. Jeroboam took ten northern tribes. Uh, they followed him. Uh, and then Rehoboam to the south took Judah and Benjamin, collectively known as Judah. Uh, and those two nations were separated until eventually the northern nations, uh, nation made up of those ten tribes, were taken away into captivity Again, 722 for them, and then Judah fared a little better because they were more obedient uh, in comparison to their neighbor to the north, Israel, uh, and they lasted till 586 B.C. Now, MacArthur notes in reference to this covenant, he said, Adherence to the Mosaic Covenant was the means through which Israel could stay connected to the blessings of the Abrahamic Covenant, Though Israel promised to obey, the biblical record demonstrates that Israel disobeyed God and faced curses for breaking the covenant. And what we see with Micah and what we find in overall, if you look at God's wrath and how he deals with the nation, according to uh, 
uh, Paul in Romans chapter 1, when, when God rejects a nation, or rather I should say when a nation rejects God, there are certain consequences that come as a result of that rejection. Paul makes it clear that when God uh, abandons a nation because the, the nation rejects God, then the first thing that happens is a sexual revolution. The next thing that follows after the sexual revolution is a homosexual revolution. And then the next thing that follows after that is lawlessness in the land. You have a person who has a debased mind. They can't think straight. Now, that's what the Scriptures say. I'm not looking at what's going on in the contemporary culture. Rather, I'm interpreting the tempor contemporary culture by what Scripture says, not the other way around. And what we find, though there may be similarities in our own culture today, but what we find by looking back at the Bible and how God dealt with them, God always, it appears, in terms of His wrath and demonstrating His wrath, is progressive. God is always pleading. He's always calling back to repentance. But the patience of God runs out. And so what we see today is God speaking to the nation of Israel and Judah, remember both tribes or both kingdoms, uh, through the prophet Micah. And so as we look at chapter 1 today, verses 1 through 16, we're going to discuss Micah's prophecy, that is God's direct revelation given to Micah, which Micah will in turn give to the people. Uh, then you have Micah's predictions, which is actually God's predictions to Micah, which Micah will relate to the people. And then finally, Micah's pain what happens as a result of God making these declarations of what He will do. So let's consider, at the outset, the prophecy. Micah receives a prophetic word from God. Look at verse 1. The word of the Lord which came to Micah of Morsheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. These were the kings of Judah which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Now, Micah's name means, who is like Yahweh? Who is like Yahweh? Uh, the reason he's getting this revelation is his primary emphasis of ministry is to Judah, uh, and he ministered during the time of about 730 B.C. to about 700 B.C. So we know that he ministered during the Assyrian captivity. Why? Because that happened in, remember, 722. His hometown is Morsheth Gath, which if you look at the map up here, everything that is in blue is part of the kingdom of Israel, those ten northern tribes. And then everything in the yellowish color is the kingdom of Judah, which is the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. The little red star there is uh, Morsheth Gath, which is where Micah held from. Again, during the time of his ministries, these are two lists of the kings of Israel, which were to the north, and the kings of Judah, which was to the south. So we can see uh, Micah minister right there around that halfway point in the list of the kings of Judah. So the prophetic word comes uh, to Micah, but it concerns both Israel, that is the northern tribes, and Judah, which is to the south. Samaria is the capital of Israel, kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. And Jerusalem is the capital of Judah. Now, one of the things we need to keep in mind so that we don't get confused is sometimes he will use the term Jacob or Israel to refer collectively to all of Israel, which would include Israel and Judah. Sometimes he will use the term Israel to speak of the ten northern tribes. So the question becomes, how do we know when he's talking about everyone versus when he's talking specifically out of the ten tribes? The answer is context, context, and context. So let's consider these predictions, and we find those beginning in verse 2. God's pronouncement of judgment. He says, Hear, O peoples, all of you. Listen, O earth, and all it contains, and let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from His holy temple. 
For behold, the Lord is coming forth from his place. He will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. The mountains will melt under him, and the valleys will be split like wax before the fire, like water poured down a steep place. Now, if you are in Israel, and if you are in Judah, both kingdoms, you hear Micah say that, you know what you're doing? Yes. Why? Because God's in covenant relationship with us through the Mosaic Covenant. Who's the context of what he's talking about? Hear, O peoples, plural, everyone, this is what God's going to do. Now, were the Israelites experiencing oppression from their neighbors? Certainly. Did they believe at one time God was going to come and to rule and set everything that which is wrong, make it right? Yes. The problem was, though, however, they did not see iniquity within themselves. Dr. Gary Smith writes, quote, Up to here... Micah's audience is probably identifies positively with what he has said because the Hebrews look forward to the day when God would come in power and judge the nations, particularly the strong nation of Assyria, which is threatening their future. So God is beginning to pronounce judgment and He's calling, using courtroom language, everyone to come to the courtroom where God is going to act as judge, He is going to act as witness, and He is going to act as prosecutor. And we see that in His proclamation of judgment. He says, all this is for the rebellion of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. Here he's talking collectively about all of Israel. He says, what is this rebellion of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? What is, remember, Samaria is the capital of Israel. So he's talking about that branch. In other words, he's being all inclusive. He's not singling people out in terms of, uh, you know, individuals. He's talking about everyone. Because if you were to ask the people of Samaria, the north, about the issues with the people of the South, they'd say, yeah, those people down there, they're, they're messed up. The people in the South would say, oh, well, we're good, but it's the people up North who were messed up. What God is saying is everyone is messed up. He said, what is the rebellion of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? What is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? In other words, no, you all have issues. You all have problems. He says, for I will make Samaria, here he's making a reference to the ten northern tribes, a heap of ruins in the open country, planting places for a vineyard. I will pour her stones down into the valley, and I will lay bare her foundations. All her idols will be smashed, all her earnings will be burned with fire, and all her images I will make desolate. For she collected them from a harlot's earnings, and to the earnings of a harlot they will return. What God is saying here, and we know by means of the Assyrians, He's going to use them to wipe them out. And notice that He singles out here the cities. The capital of Israel, Samaria, the capital of Judah, Jerusalem. And he said, it's beginning here, but it's all over. And it needs to be stamped out. It needs to be removed. But that's really reflective of the way it is really everywhere. If you want to know the pulse of how it is morally within a nation, look at her cities. Look at her cities. I mean, take our own country, for example. Think about everything that's going on in all of the major cities all over the United States. Crime, poverty, I mean, it's sexual immorality all over, everywhere, which is really indicative of the moral state of the country. 
Ken Ham in reference to that because a as we begin to think and see all of this crime, it's really reflective of a heart issue and it's reflective of a heart issue that is rejecting God, that does not believe God. And it's a big problem. Just this past month, Barna put out a poll in reference to those who believe in God and so forth. Ken Ham commenting on this poll said, no, quote, only 68% of young people believe in God. That means roughly that three out of every ten young people you talk to would claim to be an atheist. This fits with what we know about millennials and Generation Z. In fact, Generation Z is said to be the first post-Christian nation. Why? Because parents, churches, society... The pastors are failing and have failed in their mission to bring their children up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. As a result, this causes great and tremendous pain to Micah. Because why? Because he knows that the ten northern tribes are going to go into way into captivity. But Judah as a whole, too, is not going to remain unscathed through this process. They too will be impacted. In 701, the Assyrian king came down and took 200,000 people from their kingdom into away into captivity. They were always having to deal with the issues of Assyria and later on Babylon. Micah saw this in his country's future. And it caused him great pain. Consider his plea. We see this in verses 8 through 10 where Micah mourned. Israel's pending exile. Uh, Dr. Bob Chisholm from Dallas Seminary notes, quote, Having described Samaria's fall, the prophet was ready to move on to Jerusalem. He lamented what was about to happen, for he realized that Samaria's moral corruption had infected Judah as well and had even reached Jerusalem. Look at what he says in verse 8. <clears throat> because of this, I must lament and wail. I must go barefoot and naked, a sign of outward and open repentance and sorrow. He said, I must make a lament like the jackals. Now it's interesting because we don't really have jackals just running around here. Uh, it would probably be comparable to something like a coyote or perhaps like a wolf. Um, if, if you've ever heard a pack of wolves or a pack of coyotes, particularly at nighttime, I mean, sometimes it'll wake us up and they'll be out in the, the, the woods and you can just hear them. It is, it is the loneliest, most painful, hollow, like sound that you can imagine. And it's a continual wail. It's, it's almost like, please, someone put that dog out of its misery. And that's what he's saying here. We need to wail over our sins. And mourning like an ostrich. Some have said ostriches make a very hollow kind of cry when they sound. This could also be possibly a desert owl. Uh, you know, owls can make a pretty screeching sound as well. It sounds like as if they are in pain or something. I'm uh, reminded of the show My Cousin Vinny. I'm not recommending you to watch that by any stretch of the means, but I'm just saying there's one scene in the movie where Joe Pesci is staying out in a cabin. Uh, they're from the city. They're not used to being in the country. And there's a screech owl that's outside of their cabin. And all of a sudden you hear this loud, crazy sound. And Joe Pesci comes out and starts shooting out into the woods. Why? Because he has no idea what it is, but he knows it sounds horrible. And so these... Lament, cry out, mourn like these animals. Why? For, explanation, her wound is incurable. It's going to happen. For it has come to Judah. It has reached the gate of my people even in Jerusalem. So Micah is mourning in Israel's pending exile. Also, Micah uses irony in verses 11 through 15 as it relates to the names of Judah's towns as a response to Israel's exile. Now, I'll tell you kind of what this is. Um, 
Micah is, is writing to the people here of Judah. And he's going to make a play on the towns. Like, for example, a lot of my family originally are from Mississippi. There's a little town there called Jumpertown. Population, probably 500 and something people. So if you say Jumpertown, people from around the area know Jumpertown. And so if I were to say Jumpertown is going to have a pain experience. You will jump more than you've ever jumped before in order to try to get away from it. You see the pun there. The pun is the physical movement of you jumping is equated with the name Jumpertown. So Micah does that with these cities. For example, when he says, tell it not in Gath. Gath can mean to tell or to speak or to, to, to make something known. And so when he says, tell it not in Gath, tell it not in Telltown. That's the meaning of that phrase. Beth Laafra means house of dust. And Micah says in verse 10, roll yourself in dust. Shafir means beauty town. He tells them, you, you should become naked and ashamed. Zahanan means going out. And Micah says, you will not go out to escape. Beth Ezel means house of the taken away. And Micah tells them, it will be taken away from you. Merath means bitter town. Micah basically tells them, you can expect good, but will be bitter. Lakish sounds like team of horses. Micah tells them you should prepare chariots for escaping the, uh, the Assyrians. Morsheth Gath sounds like betrothed. Micah tells them the city will be promised to an enemy. In other words, your city is going to be betrothed to the enemy, not someone that you would want to marry. So he's making a play on all of the, the either the way the city sounds in Hebrew or what the city means in Hebrew, and then he's drawing these compare uh, these comparisons using these these puns or these analogies Akzib means deception or disappointment what Micah is saying is that the city would know what disappointment feels like and deceive Israel's kings Marsha means to conquer and what Micah says to them is the city will be conquered And then in the closing part of the chapter, we see this in verse 16. Micah instructs the people of Judah to give the proper response. In light of God's coming judgment. Which again, the, the Israelites, that is collectively Israel and Judah, should have, were probably happy when they first heard this until they realized it was directed at them. Again, Judgment has to begin with the house of God. It has to begin with the people of God. Judgment will come. And all of the judgments in terms of what we see at the very beginning about God coming down and leveling mountains and so forth, those things will happen. We know they'll eventually happen during the time of the tribulation period. And at least in an ultimate sense. But Micah says, what should our response to be to this, this word of the Lord? Look at verse 16. He says, make yourself bald and cut off your hair. Again, a sign of outward mourning because of the children of your delight. Extend your baldness like the eagle. Why? For they will go away from you into exile. I mean, think of it. Now, notice he says, extend your baldness like an eagle. He's not talking about the American bald eagle. That's, 
a pretty majestic looking bird. I mean, many of us have seen pictures of, you know, the eagle with a tear in its eye or the eagle screeching and so on. And it's a majestic looking bird. I think more of a buzzard. You know, those birds where they stop and on the side of the road about that big for the roadkill. You ever seen one up close? They're kind of ugly looking. They're, they're, they look bald. Everything else is feathers and right around their head, everything is just bald. That's the image that Micah presents. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, what should Micah's response teach us about our own sin, our own times, our own day? Dr. Walt Kaiser, in his commentary notes, should we not mourn over the sins of our own nation? Wouldn't it be heartless to withhold the offer of grace and mercy to even the vilest of offenders in the midst of our proclamations of pending doom? And will not our listeners discern that we care what is going to happen to them, even if the message distresses them? Sometimes we love the truth so much that we do not care about the people that it affects. That was not the heart of the servant of God, and therefore it ought never to be ours. So what should we do? In light of all of this, because much of what we saw that was facing Micah in terms of the culture is exactly what we see that is facing us today. Let me give you two suggestions. First, Christians should individually and collectively, that means you doing it by yourself and then all of us together, should seek to engage people within their spheres of influence with the gospel, with Christian service, and with discipleship. Ask yourself this question, and don't raise your hand. I'm not, I'm just, it's a rhetorical question. But how many people have you shared the gospel with in the past six months? How many people do you engage in terms of Christian service? That you serve them? Go cut their grass, take them to the store, bring them groceries, take them to the hospital. And what about discipleship? Do you have a group of people or at least one person in whom you're regularly interacting with, with which you are much further along than that person and you're bringing them up to speed, so to speak? That's how discipleship is done. It's not going to a class necessarily and listening to a speaker give data. It's rather the day-to-day building of each other into their lives through interaction and through common things. I mean, when Timothy was with Paul, he didn't sit down and say, Okay, Paul, for the next eight hours we're going to have a little class. You tell me everything you know. No. It was accomplished by Paul conducting the ministry, Timothy with him, and they were doing the ministry together, and Timothy would be asking questions as they were going about what? Doing ministry. The day of the casual Christian is over. Erwin Lutzer notes, No longer is it possible just to drift along hoping that no tough choices will have to be made. At this point in American history, any moral or spiritual progress will have to be won at great cost. The darker the night, the more important every candle becomes. And I want to say, if you're watching this by tape, and this is the first time that I've addressed specifically people watching by video, but if you're a pastor or in a church and you are not preaching the Word of God, you need to do that right now. You need to put aside social uh, justice issues and put aside the contemporary issues of the day and get back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the patriarchs and the Bible and the Gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ and whoever the Son sets free is free indeed. That's what you need to be preaching. Be faithful to our calling. Ministers, preachers, And Bible teachers need to get back to preaching about sin, sound doctrine, and salvation. Michael Horton in his book, Christless Christianity, writes, 
The church in America today is so obsessed with being practical, relevant, helpful, successful, and even well-liked that it mirrors the world itself. Aside from packaging, there is nothing that cannot be found in most churches today that could not be satisfied by any number of secular programs and self-help groups. The focus still seems to be on us and our activity rather than on God and His work in Jesus Christ. That is the message that saves, and that is the message we must preach. That is the message we must teach. Many find it difficult because it can be offensive. But it is a simple message. It doesn't require a seminary degree. It requires an open heart submission to Christ and the gospel truth. And it's a simple message that saves. What is the message? That man is a sinner by nature and by choice. That Christ came as a man. That He was born of the Virgin Mary. That He lived a sinless life. That He died on a cross for sinners. That He rose from the grave on the third day. That He ascended into heaven. That He sat down at the right hand of God. That He will return for His people. That He will rule and judge the nations. That He will give the kingdom back to the Father so that God may be all in all. And that He saves everyone who calls on His name. And that if the Son of God makes you free, you are free indeed. Why cannot we teach and preach that message? Robert Moffat said it this way. He said, we shall have all eternity in which to celebrate our victories. But we have only one swift hour before the sunset in which to win them. Micah's plea was to demonstrate a sense of urgency and possible repentance in his people to avoid the judgment. But it didn't happen. Now, I'm telling you in reference to the United States and what's going on and questions have been asked in reference to are we in biblical prophecy and all of these other things. And the answer to the question is, no, we are not. But that should not be our issue. That should not be our concern. Why? Because the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is never won through political influence or power. It is one one heart at a time, one soul at a time, when you and I share the gospel with the Lord Jesus Christ and people get saved. They get delivered from sin and death and sickness. The things of this life that hold them down. Because if the Son makes you free, you are free indeed. This is the message of good hope. This is the message that will build the kingdom. This is Micah chapter 1.